Um, thank you, thank you everybody for attending uh, this event and most importantly, uh, uh, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Bazu for being here with us again. Um, if you are a parent of La Scuola, you obviously, uh, Sanjay needs no introduction. Uh, if you're new to La Scuola, you, you should know that um, we were uh, so fortunate to be able to navigate the possibly the most challenging 18 months in the history of La Scuola and, and the world um, with this uh, incredibly uh, talented scientist and, and doctor. Uh, we have been basing all of our decisions on uh, data and science and peer-reviewed publications versus uh, newspaper articles that are written uh, so that they can get more clicks from all of us, uh, anxious people and parents. And so I think uh, this has served as well. Uh, we want to keep everyone safe, our students, our staff, and all of you. And we believe that uh, we do that by uh, really uh, being very rigorous uh, as to looking at scientific publications and data. Um, so Sanjay, thank you again for your time. Um, and also officially, let me welcome you to the La Scuola Board of Directors. And Jay is going to be a new board member for us. So thank you for the time you have dedicated to us uh, in the past almost two years now. Uh, thanks, Valentina. And thanks especially to uh, Danny for all the work that she's done uh, keeping La Scuola safe. Um, can all of you see my slides? Does that look OK? So there's a lot to update on. Um, I'm trying to go through this and answer all the questions that were submitted. So thank you for those questions. Uh, I'll try to answer it through the course of the slides, but also leave plenty of time if there's additional questions um, for the end. So a couple of different points. There's a lot of new data from San Francisco, including in the past week, even in the past few hours. So I'm gonna to try to update you on the state of affairs in SF. Naturally, I'm going to talk about Delta, Delta Plus, Lambda, all the way to Zeta variants. We've exhausted the entire Greek alphabet, so the question is what to do. Um, tell you about some new timelines in terms of the child vaccination schedule, some caveats around uh, vaccination, some new updates that will be coming soon in terms of the vaccination, both in terms of data and authorizations and rollouts, and give you some rollout timelines to expect, and then, of course, answer questions testing, masking, overall approach, a number of different things. Caveat here, of course, is this is all my personal opinion. It doesn't reflect the opinions of anyone else, not of La Scuola, not of any institutions I'm affiliated with. This is not personal medical advice. I think the lawyers are now satisfied that I've given all my disclaimers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, first slide, percent vaccinated in San Francisco. In terms of full vaccinations, we've just hit a little over 70%, but I'm going to show you the data by neighborhood, which do have some pretty considerable variations in terms of how we compare in San Francisco to the rest of the population. You can see the numbers in the bottom left for California and the U.S. as a whole. One thing that's going to be announced within the, well, I guess maybe eight minutes ago or so, um, is that SF is going to be requiring vaccination for uh, vaccination proof for entering certain indoor establishments. So uh, bars, restaurants, gyms, and a few other establishments, there'll be a list distributed shortly, uh, but one will be mandated to show that you've had a complete vaccination series, not just one plus dose as it is in New York. Um, so if you got the Johnson & Johnson, it will be one dose, and if you got either Moderna or Pfizer, two doses, or if you got a vaccine abroad, then a complete vaccination card on either your CDC or WHO card or you can show the QR code from the California vaccination verification system. That is going into implementation now. I have some good news, which I imagine is unexpected. The first is that over the past few weeks, despite all of the understandable and, and, and important worry concerning Delta variant, we've actually seen what is typically expected of highly vaccinated areas in the context of variant-based outbreaks and occurs with other viruses as well which is that we're actually seeing our incidents come down after compression of a, of a spike. So we were up at 43 cases per 100,000 uh, and San Francisco has been steadily coming down over the past several uh, days to weeks, um, now to 29 and expecting continued compression. And this is kind of the hyper-local local epidemics one sees when there's considerable herd immunity. Um, pockets of the population who remain unvaccinated get infection suddenly and there's a localized spike. 
total contrast to Texas and Florida where there are large numbers of unvaccinated folks and you see not only the spike at a much higher level, but also a much more sustained plateau without clear evidence of necessarily reaching a peak yet, let alone going down as it is here. Um, the infection rate, as I indicated, has been going down since uh, the last several weeks, actually with pretty strong indications since uh, early to mid-July. Again, total contrast to what's going on in much of the rest of the country and one portion of Northern California, as well as one portion of the Central Valley that are uh, experiencing this. Um, San Francisco looks to be crashing um, down towards the desired value below one of the reproductive number. So uh, commonly called R. RE is the effective reproductive number in the context of vaccination. You wanna see that less than one, R naught or R zero um, is like, what is it? Uh, how many secondary cases are there for each primary case in a fully susceptible unvaccinated population? Um, deaths thankfully have uh, not been uh, very prevalent in, in San Francisco. We do have some older adults who have been in the hospital for long periods and one did die several weeks ago, um, but overall no recent uh, deaths. Thankfully, um, the child rate of infections, even with the Delta wave is about 6% of all COVID infections, about 2% of all COVID hospitalizations and 0% of, of any COVID deaths in San Francisco among people less than 18. Here's some data by neighborhood. So this is over the last couple months, updated uh, through the 7th. The, um, I wanna draw your attention to a few things. First, um, as you probably saw during the previous updates, the Mission and Bayview along with the, uh, areas of the Tenderloin have been hardest hit by infections. But note that uh, due to a lot of work from the county and city, Bayview Hunters Point has had a tremendous amount of vaccination occurring over the last month. Um, now with 84% of the Bayview vaccinated, that was definitely the hardest hit neighborhood. And one can't walk two blocks in that neighborhood without being offered a vaccine at this point. Um, there's some, also a tremendous amount of take up in the mission. A lot of the people who are among the younger folks affected uh, were particularly Latino in the mission and self-reporting that there were essential workers could not afford to stay home and work. Um, and the, we see very high uptake of vaccination there. There's some work to do in the Marina and the Presidio. Um, this box over on the left is, is more missing data. So don't assume that, that folks living over by the, the lake are getting unvaccinated. Um, there's data discrepancies both for here and in Treasure Island. But for some reason, uh, Presidio Marina, particularly among younger folks, 20 to 30 years of age, who don't see as good vaccination rates as hoped for. And there's a number of campaigns going on in order to try to address this. Now, one big source of frustration I imagine among parents is not having good data on schools. As of right now, and thank you for whoever asked the question concerning where the data is around schools. As of right now, the data have not been updated since the last school year in terms of infections cases in schools. And in corresponding with the SFPPH, they promised that over the next couple of weeks, and I'm sure myself and others will bother them about this, they will update this dashboard. The school is one of the earlier schools to open. Um, and so they're really trying to prepare more for the SFUSD opening, understood. Uh, but at this point, there's no outbreaks among schools. There has been some further analysis, however, of what occurred during the last school year and over the summer. And particularly interesting is to see how many folks were affected um, and how this might defy intuition a little bit. People who are fully um, in schools and in pods where they were masking actually seem to do the best in terms of infection rates. And curiously, although upon further investigation, it made more sense, those who were fully remote actually did not as well. This was often due to having more interactions with family and outside of school um, uh, friends and uh, pods that were not quite as secure as thought. Um, also, particularly in locations that were more rural and had higher incidence rates. Hybrid was the worst um, in which people were sometimes in school, sometimes not in school. It actually just kind of mixed both populations and, and so ended up being the most perverse. This again being historical data from previous school year, not anything current. 
So this is a little bit of a noisy slide, but I, I bring it up intentionally in order to talk a bit about age specific cases um, as they relate to the Delta variant and as they relate to SF in particular. So this is all SF specific data. Let's begin with the top left. This is percent of the population that is made up of by each age group. So the gray is just what proportion of the population is of that age in the general SF city and county. Uh, the blue in the top left is how many cases have occurred, uh, especially over the last couple of months. And in, in this context, it's, a, it's about six, a little over 6% of cases in people who are lower than vaccinated age. Um, no deaths among children in SF, thankfully, and still really uh, among uh, the hardest hit are the most elderly. In terms of period where Delta variant started um, dominant, and, um, really a little bit before early June now in retrospective studies, we saw uh, an uptick in uh, particularly some of the right on the cusp of vaccination age, 12 year olds to slightly older than 12 year olds, 12 and 13, more than some of the younger kids. And now that has been downtrending, and uh, this isn't updated through the second week of August, but is downtrending considerably over the last two weeks, thankfully. As you all know, probably by now, Delta is the dominant variant. There's a number of mutations in the Delta variant. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about other things you may hear um, besides Delta, and also share what we know about infectiousness of Delta, differences between Delta and other variants, um, uh, latest studies on vaccine efficacy in Delta and other variants, and a little bit of context around that. Um, so the WHO classification system of Greek letters has gone through all of the different variants all the way through Zeta, and now is reclassifying in different terms since the Greek alphabet's been exhausted. Uh, it's not uncommon for coronaviruses and a few other types of viruses for uh, lots and lots of variants to appear, especially when there's widespread transmission. There's a lot of natural selection uh, going on, and so variations and mutations are expected. But of course, the Delta one is concerning because of its higher infectiousness. Um, the evidence to date suggests that a lot of folks are misinterpreting the infectiousness data. So is it more infectious for kids? Uh, that does not appear to be the case. Rather, it appears to be the case that kids are making up a larger portion of the unvaccinated population because uh, more adults are vaccinated. And so they're actually proportionately increasing in terms of how many kids are affected versus adults. Um, also, no real evidence yet, and we'll have more definitive finalized data from ongoing studies in a, about a month and a half, but the preliminary the studies don't suggest increased severity among parents, um, excuse me, among children of, of the Delta variant. I apologize, I'm getting lots of emails, so I'm going to close that other window. The other thing to note is some notes about Delta Plus. Delta Plus is basically a version of Delta in which there's an additional uh, set of mutations. Those mutations were thought to potentially increase transmissibility, but actually it turns out that that's not a replicable finding. Uh, and so that the news on that has kind of waned, I think appropriately. Um, a Lambda variant has also come up a lot. There was initial uh, speculative commentary suggesting that the mutant mutations on the Lambda variant may make it more resistant to vaccination, but a, a properly done study at NYU shows that the antibody response is actually quite robust against the Lambda variant. So again, I'd be cautious about two preliminary uh, concerns about variations. The other thing to note is that while there's a lot of studies on variants in antibody response, that's only really half the immune system response, but really also contributes to determining severity of the infection in particular is the T cell response. And against um, essentially all these variants, the T cell response remains really robust. And so we have to distinguish between just getting infected, which of course is a concern, but severity of infection, which is the biggest concern. And that's where the vaccines are particularly helpful in reducing severity, the hospitalization risk and the risk of death. So here's the data on how different vaccines are uh, effective against different variants that are common enough variants that they've been studied. 
So let's isolate your attention to Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J for the moment. Uh, the AstraZeneca is the Oxford vaccine, which we don't have as prevalent. Uh, but maybe if you travel internationally and, and had your vaccinations internationally, that might be relevant to you. Delta is here in the orangish yellow color. Uh, and we see pretty good effectiveness against symptomatic COVID. Again, not just against all forms of infection, but uh, infections that lead to symptoms, hospitalizations, deaths. Moderna was tested in a single uh, dose study. And very recently, I believe yesterday by press release, a non-peer reviewed study was put out which was a very poorly conducted study in my opinion. What they did is they took um, electronic health record data from the Mayo Clinic system and um, compared folks who had breakthrough infections and how many of them had Moderna and how many of them had Pfizer versus not being vaccinated. And they suggested that the Moderna vaccine was really effective and the Pfizer was not. A um, couple concerns about the study. Uh, other than not being peer-reviewed or published yet and being distributed by press release, which is kind of a scientific no-no, um, they, what they sampled from was Mayo Clinic patients. So people with really severe illnesses, often with cancer, not really generalizable to the population. The majority of that population actually got Pfizer um, ahead of time and that diluted the uh, overall sample such that they had really small sample size on the Moderna side um, that can lead to a particular type of bias when doing this type of assessment. Um, you get this thing called a mortal time bias, where essentially if you're not observing a person long enough, you can see that they're protected, but they kind of haven't had enough chance, quote unquote, to get infected. And so that, that gives you a, a really biased estimate. Um, so I would say that the, the current indications are relatively good efficacy of the mRNA vaccines. I'll come back to the question of what to do if you've had the Johnson & Johnson and some further data that'll come forward um, regarding Johnson & Johnson vaccination. Should you get a booster? Should you get a different vaccine? Those kinds of questions. Um, before I do that, I did want to address the question of are kids getting more hospitalized in the context of Delta? There's lots of anecdotal reports. It looks like it depends on um, who you define as kids. and how you specify the age ranges. So uh, particularly in June and July, as things crash and through the early periods of August, um, those who were uh, in the older adolescent population or 18 to 21 in particular did start to make up a, a greater portion relatively. This is absolute numbers on the top. This is the relative proportion on the bottom uh, in terms of hospitalizations. Those who were in the zero to four year old range or the five to 17 year old range continued to make up less than 3% of hospitalizations. Um, very much varied, however, by which state you lived in or which area of which state you lived in. And through the course of the Delta um, rise, those states with lower vaccinations had a lot more proportionate infections among the young, whereas those higher vaccinated states, including ours, did not as much. If we zoom in on it, however, um, sorry that this is so pixelated, but this is the largest I can make the graphic. New admissions, if, if you really zoom in and you're starting to get axes that are relatively small and subject to lots of noise, uh, you know, day-to-day -day variations being uh, almost a quarter of your axis, you do see a rise um, in kids uh, being admitted uh, in California. Uh, a lot of this is outside of San Francisco in particular, uh, in some of the Northern regions and some of the Central Valley. But again, notice the, this is 0.3 per 100,000 population. We're talking about three, three per million um, as compared to other age groups, you know, who are on a Y-axis scale of 20. Compare that to places that don't have as much adult vaccination. Florida, you're, uh, you know, up at 12 kids per million. And again, like a very off the charts axis where California wouldn't even be visible if you plotted on the same axis would be down here. How much breakthrough is occurring? Um, so the amount of breakthrough, um, I'm concerned about folks saying that breakthrough is common, that I think by any definition of common, that's untrue. Um, breakthrough at most among fully vaccinated people is 0.5% in Arkansas of vaccinated people. Note that the axis here is 5% at most. And in California, breakthrough is at 
0.1% uh, of people who are fully vaccinated, super low levels. And those are with any type of diagnosis, including false po potential false positives on the tests, uh, no hospitalizations and no deaths. So that's really what we care about the most. So I would not say breakthrough with Delta is common. I would say it's exceedingly uncommon. How many cases of any kind of COVID, forget hospitalization or death, um, are among the vaccinated? Uh, overall, among all the cases of COVID, we're looking at 1.4% in California and those places that are less vaccinated having higher levels. So, you know, it, it, consistent with herd immunity, herd immunity helps those who are vaccinated and didn't have a good immune response as it helps those who are unvaccinated as well. One of the most important points is among kids, so concern of parents, particularly in the context of Delta, is where are the kids getting it from? Uh, so far, the rise in Delta when contact tracing is done is not very attributable or not at all attributable to school or daycare related or summer camp related transmission. Uh, the vast majority far and above has been household related or peri household related transmission. So most of the kids, particularly in Florida and Texas that we're seeing who are getting more sick are from relatives who are unvaccinated. Um, in this case, this is the AstraZeneca vaccine, this is the Pfizer vaccine. Seeing the risk of household transmission go down really substantially um, to you know about half the risk, even if you're in the same household, which is pretty impressive with an unvaccinated kid. What um, timeline do we have for kid vaccination? So there's a lot uh, happening over the next month. So first, as you may have heard, both Pfizer and Moderna are applying for authorization to have a third dose among the immunocompromised. How do we define immunocompromised here? Here it's people who have had a solid organ transplant, so kidney transplant, lung transplant, heart transplant, et cetera, or people who are on systemic steroids, not steroids that are inhaled, but for example, prednisone, or those who are on TNF-alpha inhibitors. So if you have something, uh, a medication that uh, the name ends in imumab or isumab, uh, those are the types of immunosuppressants that may uh, lead you to being eligible for this type of third dose. In addition, the CDC is recommending pregnant women now that some of the studies on pregnant women are concluded, um, not finding any impact negative on uh, fertility or on births and, and the health of the baby or of the mother. Um, that recommendation is going through for pregnant women to get immunized now by any set of vaccines. Um, in the next week or two, um, I would expect some of the preliminary data from Pfizer to be released for the five to 11 year olds. The early data uh, are, are under embargo, but I can say that they're good. Um, similarly, J&J's two-dose data will be released. That is, um, how much impact does the second dose among people with uh, receiving J&J, how much does that boost uh, immunity? In September, Pfizer is still planning on seeking approval for the five to 11-year-olds. And then October, probably early October, we'll get the data on the less than five-year-olds with subsequent approval for the two to five range. Still unclear a little bit about vaccinating the less than two, most likely it'll initially be the two to five range. You may have heard that additional sample size has been entered into the Pfizer and Moderna studies uh, for young adults. That is true, um, in particular to help characterize the risk of pericarditis. And I'll talk to, about that in a little bit uh, more. Um, the Pfizer is targeting a, a November availability at all ages. And some of the studies that they have done and some associate labs have done is heat stability studies. So as you may recall, Pfizer had to be stored under um, freezer settings that were not necessarily available very widely, um, mostly hospital freezers and less so clinic freezers. And with recent studies showing stability of the vaccine at higher temperatures, now there's a plan for broader distribution in special packages to a broader array of clinics, including some mobile vaccine, um, like RVs that have been converted for vaccination. There's also emerging data that'll be coming out soon on what if you got one dose of one vaccine and a, another dose of, of a different vaccine, either of the same type, mRNA or of a different type. Um, those are encouraging studies that'll probably be released in November. But as of now, I would anticipate that uh, kids will be vaccinated consistently 
with one vaccine type, and it's more for people who get vaccinated in the next calendar year that that would be more relevant. Um, Moderna has been a little less clear as far as I am aware of their timeline. And so they'll be seeking approval in the fall, but we don't know what the fall means. Um, and so I would anticipate more on the, on the Pfizer timeline, which has been very much more specific. Current safety data. So the safety data, of course, are from the 12 to 17 year olds. They haven't yet been released officially from the five to 11 year olds. Uh, although they're actually uh, more encouraging from that group as we see in a few weeks. Among adolescents, a few of them get a condition known as pericarditis, more rarely myocarditis. So the heart is surrounded by essentially a, a fibrous Ziploc bag that prevents the heart muscle from banging up against the ribs uh, and the lungs. And it beats inside of this Ziploc bag, um, the pericardium. And at times the tissue of the pericardium can itself become inflamed. And pericarditis, unlike a heart attack, which is more of a dull ache, um, a pericarditis is like a sharp pain. Uh, it feels like a sharp rib pain and it can feel better um, depending on your positioning. If you're putting more pressure on the pericardium, it can be more acute. And this happens more in adolescent males. It's still a rare condition. Um, and so it's quite a bit more rare than being infected by COVID or getting the multi-system inflammatory syndrome that is really concerning among kids with COVID. And so it suggests that on balance, at least from my interpretation, the risk benefit still very much favors vaccination. It is quite a bit more rare in females than males for reasons that are not well understood, but pericarditis in general is more, more common in adolescent males. So questions. Um, so to try to leave plenty of time for questions, I'd say th these two represent the most common cluster of questions. And I'll also address a few other questions and see if I have left anything unaddressed that I'm able to answer. But let me start by reading these two and then we can go from there. So um, the first one re reflects, uh, I think, a series of, of common themes. With the rise in Delta, why are masks optional outside, smaller kids not distance, and transmission seems much more possible outside than previously. So that's um, one concern. Thank you for that. Uh, second uh, kind of contrasting question, uh, why should kids wear masks? So children have been known to transmit COVID, but far less often than adults do. A North Carolina study conducted before vaccines were available found not a single case of student to teacher transmission when 92,000 students were in school. The faster spreading Delta variant has emerged since, but many teachers, parents of children 12 and over have also been vaccinated. Show me any science justifying why kids should wear masks. So I would say this, um, these two questions and perspectives underlying them kind of uh, are the, the two dominant camps that one sees in the questions. Certainly emails I received, those are kind of the, the common tone. So I'll try to address um, both of them simultaneously um, in, in this context. So. First, a uh, little note about what data do we have to answer this question about outdoor versus indoor transmission. Um, very recently in the past, uh, oh, I think it's only been over a little over a week now, the first kind of rigorous study on this was conducted that's relevant to kids. Uh, quantifying the odds of transmission um, outdoor versus indoor. You can see the data here and particularly the third column is the most relevant. I'll, I'll distribute these slides so you can look into it in a little more detail if you'd like. Bottom line is of the, Transmission events that occur, a little over 1%, about 1.1% occur in outdoor settings if, if kids are on masks. So the majority are indoor settings, um, which bodes well for outdoor settings. That's not to say that outdoor transmission is impossible. It's just to say that it, it does seem exceedingly rare, uh, except in exceptional circumstances. Those exceptions are typically among the older kids, particularly those who have these two receptors that um, COVID tends to attach to, those are the kids above 12 in particular, um, and among adults who are in very crowded settings where we often see it, see it um, be more of a, a concern in terms of outdoor transmission without masks. Um, the second question is masks among children. Um, I'm not going to read all this and summarize the data, but what is the data on masks in children? So first to clarify, I respectfully disagree with the person who said that the North Carolina study um, suggests that masks, uh, that there was no transmission without masks. Actually, this is the website of the people who conducted the study, Research Finds Masks and Prevent COVID Transmission at Schools. The study was of North Carolina during masks, 
versus uh, the subset of North Carolina schools compared to other non-North Carolina schools that do not require licenses. And so the North Carolina um, success in terms of reducing transmission was attributed to the masks, um, not in the context of being mask free, this is uh, again, indoor masking only. Um, and in a number of other settings, usually by natural experiment, naturally we can't ethically do the experiment where we subject kids to COVID with and without masks and then in a random manner see who, who gets COVID. So we're subject, subjecting to natural experiments or, or, or poor events. And so in that case, oftentimes the data on masks among kids are from households where a parent or other family member has COVID. And then we see what happens if the local authorities have advised a kid to mask versus not or vice versa, the kid is infected and advised to mask or not. We see quite a bit of secondary reduction in transmission from those. And then also in community settings or in comparisons of schools that had indoor masking versus no indoor masking. Um, one thing I did wanna mention was why not continue with um, the screening questionnaires and temperature checking? Some schools are. Um, why is it no longer mandated and so many uh, public health authorities have poo-pooed it? There was a, a pretty large meta analysis that was conducted um, and that found that actually in many of the circumstances of screening questionnaires and the temperature checks, whether done by the uh, manual forehead thermometers or by thermal cameras, were actually resulting in false assurances or even the opposite of truth. Um, people tending to um, overemphasize uh, the nose or just fill out the screening without really honestly answering the screenings. And on the temperature checks, such extensive miscalibration and misestimation that it was providing false readings in both directions, letting people in who shouldn't have been and uh, vice versa to the point of, of essentially uh, most people concluding in the epidemiology community that this is of, of either limited or no benefit or, or perversely providing psychological reassurance without actually doing anything. Um, and unfortunately, in some cases, people are using the temperature checks and screening as an excuse not to enforce more important things like the masking and distancing. The other interesting thing as a parent is very hard for little kids to mask, and I'm sure parents and teachers and staff have noticed this. But what's interesting and reassuring is that in terms of the emission of particles and also the inhalation of particles, even intermittent masking with a simple cloth mask seems to be rather effective among kids. Adherence is super poor among kids. We all know this. It's very hard for them. It's hard for adults. Um, um, although the surgeons always remind me that they wear masks constantly all day, every day, uh, and, and don't complain about it. Uh, but, but they complain about other things. So. The, the the idea is that uh, even with limited adherence and with enforcement, it does appear to have an incremental benefit among kids, and I think is significant. The other thing I'd like to mention about masks is, of course, living here, uh, we are subjected to wildfire smoke. And one thing I would note is, uh, as an epidemiologist, the uh, sort of PM two and a half, those are particulate matter that's less than two and a half microns, has been related to uh, all-cause mortality for, for quite a, many years, actually since the, the London fog events of the 50s. And so it's, um, and, and we in California are particularly subjected to uh, wildfire-related enhancements of respiratory and cardiovascular disease. So among kids, um, it is possible to purchase masks that have a PM2.5 charcoal filter. It's a little white filter that has seams on either side and it's white and has a uh, an interior filter and that can be slipped into a mask. Some kids will find it uh, obtrusive and less easy to breathe than those, but it might be a nice thing to do, um, subject to your opinions about this uh, during the wildfire season. Just a quick mention about that. Finally, some notes about testing. What's the right decision on asymptomatic testing? I know Danny and Valentina have been working on this and thinking through uh, the guidelines. Uh, this, the various schools have been uh, at the extremes of this from no testing at all through uh, trying to test people every day, which has no biological basis, by the way. The important thing to note is that it's a balance in terms of how many false positives versus true positives one gets. And at the current performance of the most widely available tests for kids, and at the current level of incidence, uh, one does get more false positives than true positives, and it's a question of which ratio of false to true um, you're willing to accept. 
because naturally it's taking kids out of school. On the other hand, it may be preventing transmission and there's no widely accepted uh, belief in terms of what the ideal cadence is and what the ideal uh, cutoff is that has been accepted by any of the guideline issuing bodies. So it's one of those typical cases in which the guidelines have not been sufficiently specific um, and, and people are left to their own devices. But I'm happy to uh, talk more about, about this. And I know Danny and, and Valentina are working on coming up with a, a meaningful solution that'll be accessible to people for asymptomatic uh, testing. I'll now leave some time for further test questions. I think that um, this deck can be distributed to others. So I've provided some links for parents on uh, masks, test quality, if you're doing at-home tests or you're curious about what tests are being used and are they actually of good quality? There's a wide range that get FDA approval, but they're widely varying on sensitivity and specificity. Um, and also on school safety and transmission, what seems to work, what doesn't, where is there evidence, where is there not, um, and, and there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjay. And so if there are any uh, other questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, Joel will help us uh, uh, answer the, the questions. Uh, so there was one that came through. Uh, Joel, do you want to uh, read them? The first one that came through uh, from Josh. Yes, Valentina. So our first question is uh, Dr. Watcher or Watcher from UCSF tweeted today that breakthrough infections likely make up 10 to 20 percent of new cases. Um, how do we that sounds a little different from your assessment and yeah. can you talk through that, please. Yeah, um, Bob Walker at UCSF is talking specifically about the breakthrough cases that are noted and hospitalized persons. So one of the difficulties that we have is having inadequate data on genotypes in the United States. So not all cases of COVID are genotypes so that we don't know what the majority of cases are in terms of their variant type. It's only subsamples that are taken. And so um, we would expect on an overall population basis to have a higher number of breakthrough cases because if the effectiveness is 90%, then Sure, about 10% of new cases, we would expect to be breakthrough cases. But what's happening on an epidemiologic level, and that seems to be true more at the hospital end in terms of among hospitalized adults. What's happening on the epidemiologic level is, that's interesting is there's additional herd immunity for vaccinated people who are uh, ineffectively vaccinated. That is, they haven't yet had uh, protection from their vaccine. Um, and so that has to be taken into account in more population-based data, but the challenge is that the whole population is a genotype. So when you get a COVID positive test, it doesn't necessarily get uh, genetic testing uh, or is not necessarily linked to your vaccination status. And so we have to have some more data from larger representative samples. And that's some of the Kaiser data I showed you is of the larger representative sample as opposed to others. Okay, we have another question here. It says, uh, is there any information available about vaccines for under 12, uh, how they will be distributed? Uh, for example, mm -hmm. if pediatrician offices will be able to administer the vaccine. Yeah, great question. As opposed to the adult vaccines, which were first administered in hospitals and FQHCs before being administered in physicians' offices, the pediatric vaccination rollout plan from the White House currently uh, is poised to first distribute to common uh, pediatric offices. So the idea is uh, to distribute widely among uh, people who are the typical first person that kids go to. Um, that being said, because there are some kids who don't have a pediatrician, uh, aren't able to access a pediatrician, there's also a series of mobile vans and mobile units that are being deployed that will be more in the neighborhood. And then the usual set of federally qualified health centers or community health centers will also be given additional vaccines. One nice part is that the, the dosage um, Subject to further review, the dosages and, and the aliquots are unlikely to require um, differences in packaging or, or new supply per se. Um, and so for more general clinics that are already vaccinating adults or have vaccine in stock or have both pediatric and adult offices uh, like CPMC, UCSF, Kaiser, et cetera, they're already pretty well prepared. Um, and it's just a question of making an appointment, registering, and, and 
uh, ensuring that you don't need any of the contraindications before doing the vaccines. Okay, looks like we have another question. Is there any preliminary data on how quickly immune response happens in children upon vaccination? For example, does it take the full six weeks as it does in adults or is it shorter or longer? Yeah, that data will be released probably in the coming weeks uh, to months, but it's too early to tell from the existing studies, except for the studies on those who are over 12. In those over 12, the immune response is a little bit more robust than typically among adults. And so kids tend to potentially get a uh, rise to full uh, protections or full degree of protection conferred by the vaccine within a shorter period of time than among adults. I wouldn't count on it. And I would suggest that the it's likely that the public health guidance will still ask you to wait at least two weeks uh, before changing any behaviors uh, from the pre-vaccine to the post-vaccine timing. Sanjay, there was one question that came in, and I think uh, you might have already touched on this, but with early research showing the viral load of Delta infections could be a thousand times that of earlier strains, some scientists have extrapolated that a close contact with 15 minutes of exposure with previous strains could now potentially be classified a close contact with just one second of exposure to the Delta variant. What are your current thoughts on the topic? Yeah, um, I know the NYU epidemiologist who said that during their New York Times interview, and she expresses her regret for saying it because it's got a lot of flack over the last week, both from colleagues and from really nervous people who are calling her about it. Um, the math doesn't work out linearly in, in, in terms of the amount of virus you expel when coughing or sneezing or doing something else or singing or something else. Um, isn't linearly proportional to infectiousness. Um, there's this concept of ID50, which is like how much germs does it take for half the people exposed to be actually infected? And it doesn't work as a straight line. So if you put yourself in a room with what just one virus versus 10,000, it's not that you're 10,000 times more likely to be infected. There's this horribly complicated nonlinear way where it takes enough and then it's an s-shaped curve where you have to have enough virus just having one virus in the room is very unlikely to give you infection you have to have enough and then it kind of peaks out at a certain point where it's more about you your immunity and saturating you with more virus may or may not make any difference and that applies to the time as well if infectiousness or the likelihood of being infected is the product of how much germ you're infecting at times how long you're doing it for and that kind of area under the curve so the calculus folks this is the Riemann sum or the integral under the curve um, then it's it's a highly skewed and nonlinear curve there and it doesn't necessarily compress the time in such a way that before it took me 15 minutes which was an arbitrary time it was Consider it's a it's a rule of thumb. It's not a magical number that if you are only 14 and a half versus 15 and a half, there's a sizable difference in your risk. There's a continuum, and they chose 15 minutes, honestly, because the PR department at the CDC thought it would be a reasonable number for people to remember on this continuum of risk and also define exposure more precisely because people were asking for a definition and it was impossible to define a continuum. Um, Along those same lines, it's not proportionally more infectious, but one does see that it is more uh, virus per cubic micrometer um, for a Delta variant person on average. But actually, if you look at the curves um, and the distribution, it's all over the map with people being very different for reasons we still don't understand. And it's not a bell shape. It's all over the map from highly non-infectious to highly infectious. And the Delta curve is slightly shifted to the right to more infectiousness, but mostly overlapping with Alpha Gamma and the other variants. So it's really all over the place. Thank you. There's, there's another one here. I'm seeing people, everyone should feel free to, to add their questions. Um, how seriously are we looking at asymptomatic infection and transmission for unvaccinated kids? So teachers and staff, while they're vaccinated, um, the asymptomatic impact. 
Yeah, I, and I, I don't know, Danny, if you also want to address from the La Escuela standpoint, I don't, I don't speak for La Escuela, but certainly we've been talking a lot about it because um, we think it's an important part of the prevention repertoire. Um, waiting for some guidance um, from SFDPH and others in terms of the optimal timing, given where the infection rate is going in San Francisco. If you do too much, you end up with too many false positives relative to true positives. If you do too little, the opposite, which of course we don't want. Um, and also some of the tests that have been signed onto by some of the other schools, um, there's one or two companies in particular that have very successfully marketed themselves, but the test quality is very poor to the point of being really concerning. Um, and so, and, and lacking validity in kids. And so we, we don't want to do it purely for psychological benefit. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think I speak for all of us that we're trying to come up with a plan pretty rapidly that uh, is a reasonable one that also has validity. Thank you. And for those that may not be aware, we have mandated the vaccine with very limited exceptions for all of our faculty and staff. So that helps. Um, uh, mitigate that issue as well. Okay. So this, there was another question, Danny, that you put in the chat around um, the you know families not always following SFDPH guidance and and social distancing and gathering and so on. I mean, like last year, we will continue to have a pledge, we will update the pledge based on the current uh, rules, the SFDPH and, and the California Health Department and CDC put out. Um, I mean, obviously, like, like you know, I think uh, when Sanjay put those two questions where they were, you know, expressing very different opinions, uh, people feel very differently about all of this. And, you know, so we, we we can set rules in school, uh, we cannot set rules in your households. Uh, so the moment you enter uh, the door of La Scuola, we, we can reassure you that what we say we do is something that we will do. And, and we, again, we're very early adopters of the vaccination. Uh, we, want, we, want, we want all of our staff to be vaccinated. We, we issued a statement to our staff before the SF um, uh, USD pushed it out and, and the governor uh, shared it yesterday. So we are very committed to the health and safety of everyone in La Scuola. <clears throat> what happens in your homes, we cannot control. Um, and, and so we will continue to uh, recommend and highlight uh, what is safe, uh, but also in terms of the Delta variant and the risk to children. I mean, Sanjay articulated that a lot better. So with the data in front of you, we know that um, we, you will all feel differently and we will continue to share our pledge and, and hoping that, you know, everybody continues to do what they did. I think last year um, things went um, very well. I mean, you saw the data of the schools that were open in San Francisco and, and you know that what happened at La Scuola, uh, you know, no one, no one got sick in school. So that, that's really all, all that we can do for now. But uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so the, the question on exceptions, the only exceptions are the ones that are mandated, obviously, by the federal government. So, you know, like a health and, you know, where there's a, 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 a documented uh, exception that we have to follow. Hi there. I typed a question, but I, I don't know how to send it. What, what do I press to send it? You can just ask you then. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Thank you very much for the information. Uh, it was a very good uh, a presentation of data that a lot that I had not ever seen before. Anyway, my name is Jerry Bosha. I happen to be a grandfather because my daughter is flying back from Italy right now and could not participate. So she asked me to participate. Um, doctor, the question I have for you is how much better do you think two doses of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine will be versus one dose with regard to antibodies and clinical data? And are you concerned that people may develop antibodies to the non-replicating adenoviral vector, especially considering it's a human adenovirus? Yeah, good question. So taking the first part of your question first, and then I'll address the second portion. Um, on the first part, with regard to the two versus one dose for the Johnson & Johnson, I think we won't know until a couple of weeks from now when they release the data from the clinical study that is comparing two versus one formally. 
Um, there have been attempts to study people who kind of went out on their own and uh, when they heard that Johnson Johnson might be less effective and they happened to get a Johnson Johnson shot, there were a subset of people who kind of went off and, you know, went to Walgreens or CVS or whatever and got their own second dose. Um, <laughs> and um, there were some attempts to study those folks, but they're such small sample size and, you know, they don't really identify themselves because they're trying to kind of evade, evade the vaccine register. Um, that there wasn't much to conclude from those studies so far. So I think um, if we I think, were to, I think, I, think uh -huh. they're using, I think they're using a 12 week interval, right? Yeah, so that does play into it. And um, let's say we were to extrapolate from other adenoviruses, it would be really speculative because the other vaccine studies have been all over the map from really incremental benefit to wow, that second dose made a real huge uh, impact. And so I think what I've learned in the years of studying viruses is never to try to predict anything without data because uh, they will always fool you. And the only thing I can um, really guarantee is change. Um, I don't know. But once we have a few more weeks out, um, we'll be able to have a more definitive answer. The only thing I can promise is the study will be released. And it's, yeah. it's under the public release mandate. So we'll know some data in a few weeks. The, on the second point, I think it's a really interesting point. I haven't seen any um, concerning data to, to date that's robust. There's a lot of speculation about the possibilities. I'm actually a little bit more worried about clots in, in this context than about the immune system response longer term. And um, certainly it's, it's rare, thankfully, but venous sinus thromboses are, are no laughing matter. You know, it's like a pretty serious uh, clot. And um, so for, for me, that's more of the clinical concern that I would express to patients. One reason that in my clinics, we need the mRNA vaccines. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I see a question from Esther here, and I can uh, start with a third one. So typically following uh, SFTPH guidance, um, we do send exposure notices um, that differs depending on the nature of the exposure. So if someone is a co close contact, they will get a specific notification. Um, and then we send a general uh, exposure notice to the student body or the family families uh, just as a kind of courtesy to let everyone know what's, what's happening on campus. Um, and then I see the protocols for distancing children during unmasked time. So um, all faculty, um, you know, as, as you may have heard, are vaccinated. Um, all adults do wear masks indoors and we'll be doing very similar to, you know, to last year where the only unmasked times for students would be when they are eating uh, in the classroom um, or napping, I believe as well, because I think that it's in the, uh, for licensing guidelines, uh, we cannot have uh, children nap with, uh, with masks. Um, and yeah, Fede, maybe you can yeah, talk I more to that. One. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Esther, yes. Um, there are usually a mask when they are eating and sleeping. And uh, usually when they go outside, uh, even if we know we have maybe requests from parents uh, to keep them with the mask. So we are encouraged that. Uh, but usually that's are the moments where they're taking out the mask. Uh, so three kinds of moments during the day. And on the outside, and, other than the guidelines have changed, but also uh, licensing also requires us to give them breaks for little ones. Um, we are yeah. also required to give them breaks from the mask. And so the, also the outside time is the safest time to do that. And uh, what are, are there any distancing um, protocols during the mask times or is it um, is that not? Uh, part of the routine. There are no current requirements for distancing. I mean, we do try to encourage the distancing, but within reason and feasibility. Yes, yeah, certainly. And Esther, obviously, when they eat, they'll be sitting at their uh, seats, so that helps, you know, so they're not, um, you know, and then when they are a mask outside, they're, again, they are outdoors, which is a lot easier. And as you know, they tend to move at great speed when they're outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> I do see one other question here, and I know we're getting close to the time, and any questions that you submitted that may not have been answered, um, Dr. Basu has very graciously actually responded to them in writing, so we will be publishing those along with the recording for anybody that may have missed it. Um, is there a correlation between a person's reaction to the vaccine and the efficacy of the vaccine for that person? No, so far it doesn't seem to be related. 
Thank you. Uh, I see from Cherry Lau, uh, will La Scuola be updating a list of symptoms for when our child is required to be tested? Absolutely. So that is consistently updated. And I actually am going to put in the chat uh, where our, our current safety and health plan for everyone to see. Um, we try to, as soon as the updates come out, uh, you know, within 24 to 48 hours, update the site accordingly um, so that you will be able to find a link to the SFDPH or CDC uh, guidance. CDC is for symptoms for adults, I think we have, and for the health department, they share kind of a parent guardian uh, symptom check uh, so you know what to look for in your child. Okay. I think there was one last what? one, uh, Dani, on the separate desks or group desks. I think it's gonna be the same as last year. Depend, it depends on the age. Some, some are in a, a group test. There's no more requirements from the health department on that. Um, and then, you know, some, it depends on the, on the age of your child. So you can ask um, Fede and Doug yeah. uh, separately. I can respond. We have, uh, you know, kindergarten, we will probably have the same in terms of like uh, one uh, desk with like five, uh, spot and you know divided if necessary with the screen and the other upper grade will be having um, single desk yes so single desk after you know first second and third and going up and actually like a very very last question uh, is, uh you know sanjay maybe uh there is one for you a question from esther from what you currently know, would you feel confident for your unvaccinated students in high risk households to be in schools? Are there any are there any early data or indicators that give you that confidence? In terms of um, having my kids in school, I do have them in school. So let's speak to the two year old and the seven year old next week. Um, it, high risk household, I, I kind of want to understand a little bit more if it's a person who, for example, can't get vaccinated and is immunocompromised or elderly, then I think it's worth a conversation with their physician and then determining what exactly the circumstances are. Um, and frankly, that would be the case regardless of COVID just because little kids carry lots of other things. <laughs> it's RSV season. And so for older adults, um, there is the risk of pneumonias of other kinds, actually more, more than uh, from COVID. Um, so if, if there's a grandparent in the household or somebody who has a solid organ transplant, that can be uh, an important thing for, to discuss with their physician, I think. Okay, thank you so much for participating again. Like Dani said, we will be sharing this and also the questions and the answer that uh, Dr. Pazu gave to your questions. Uh, thank you again so much, Sanjay, for your time and expertise and uh, for keeping us uh, all safe. Um, uh, La Scuola parents, thank you so much. Reach out to us if you have any more questions. We know this is complicated if you are a new parent um, and we're not in school last year. Uh, this may seem overwhelming, but please know that we, you know, we're on it. We will continue to share information as it changes, and it changes frequently. Um, but it, you know, we're used to it, and and we will continue to keep you as safe as it's feasible, just like last year. Uh, the kids are so happy to be in school. We have the preschool open. Uh, it's been wonderful to have them back, and we look forward to welcome K8 next week. Grazie mille a tutti.